Okay, welcome to tonight's Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, I'd just like to welcome everybody and uh, remind members that the uh, the meeting is being uh, recorded and will be uploaded onto YouTube. I'd just like to welcome um, Councillors Chris Cook and Councillor John Harper to the committee as they're they're new to this this committee and thank uh, Councillor Maycock who has retired from this committee. Um, We've, we've got apologies from uh, the Chief Ex Executive, Andrew Barrett, um, who was intending to be here for the Joint Way Service item. Um, also apologies from Councillor Jeremy Oates and Councillor John Chesworth. Um, and while I'm just on this item, I think I will just pay tribute to uh, Councillor People, who's, who's here, and I think this is going to be his last... Um, Certainly his last infrastructure safety and growth scrutiny meeting. It is to arrange it to I have about three more committees, but this one is the last of this. So thank you. Um, well, I, I, I just wanted to say I, I've, I've been, been fortunate to have a, what I would describe as a very strong um, scrutiny committee over a number of years from a membership point of view and um, and Simon you've been a massive contributor to to uh, to scrutiny over over the years and I'd just like to say thank you very much for for your contributions most kind chair much appreciated um, okay so we'll move on to item two which are the minutes of the 16th of February meeting um, I need a mover and second. I'm happy to move. I'll give the honour of seconding to to councillor people. Thank you. All those in favour? Excellent. I'll uh, I'll sign those off as a as a as a true record. Item three are declarations of interest. If if any members have any. Excellent. Item four is the update from me. It's obviously the final meeting of this uh, municipal year. We have a very busy agenda tonight, so I'm going to try and keep things moving as as quickly as we we can, obviously, without missing anything. Um, I have taken out the work plan agenda item and, uh, and working group agenda item because I don't think we're we're, at, we're we're further forward on that, and I, d I don't think, as it's the last meeting, we need to really be discussing. Um, work plans. We've got a number of items for future meetings. I think, um, unless anybody has Simon. Sorry to come in there, Chair. Um, I had promised um, Mr. Watson, who's been communicating with the leader and I about toilets and public toilet provision. Apparently, there is a scheme uh, whereby the government will help to fund public toilets where they're run in conjunction with a kiosk or something like that and I promised that under the item about future ideas I would raise that so um, if if I could ask members to take that one as a note forward um, then I'll have done what I can <laughs> bearing in mind that he understood that this was going to be the last meeting I could only raise it sure um, if I if I'd ask you to take that into account when you're planning going forward thank you Chair. absolutely it'll be minuted and we'll We'll certainly take that on board. Thank you for that. Um, item five are responses to reports of the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Committee. Um, so we um, we obviously took um, some um, uh, recommendations to full council with regard to the fireworks. Um, so that's that one. Um, I'm not going to read the agenda items, uh, the the recommendations out. I think we we all know them from from our previous meeting, um, and we also uh, took some um, recommendations to cabinet with regard to the economic development service work plan that we that we we know we know about, and they they were agreed at cabinet last week. Um, item six. Chair. Uh, Chair. Sorry. Should we just note that the fireworks ones were actually approved at full council so yeah, for yeah. the purpose of the minutes? Absolutely, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, item six, our consideration of matters referred to um, 
infrastructure safety and growth from cabinet or council um, at last week's full council there was the petition uh, with regard to um, the um, the netting of, of hedges that was brought through and I think council um, recommended that that be um, looked at by this scrutiny committee and um, I would suggest that we we put it on the work plan um, as an item and maybe we in the in the future we will ask for a, a report to come but I, I will I will inquire if if uh, committee will indulge me to uh, to look and, uh, and and see if I can Simon you keen to come in well I, I, only as um, you said you thought the council did. The council did, did yeah. and the time scale was a report by the autumn. Yeah, so in that else. sense, whilst cabinet that can't council can't instruct the committee what to look at, there is a heavy responsibility then to actually do the re fulfil the request um, because it was the subject of a public petition. So I, I would suggest that it, it's got to at least be discussed at the next meeting simply yeah. so that you can agree a time frame or a, a working group or how you're going to tackle it in order to report by the autumn yeah i would su that'd I, be my advice yeah I, w I would suggest that it will be a work a work plan item for the june meeting and and we can move forward on that at, at, at that appropriate time um so We'll move quickly on to item seven, which is our first substantive item, which is Tamworth Community Safety Plan, which is the annual refresh that we, we look at. Now, obviously, some of this um, we, was sort of discussed at our um, focus day um, a, a month or, or or two, or a month, a month ago, yes. Um, and we have a number of recommendations, but I'll, I'll hand over to, to Joe Sands to uh, to take us through that. Thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the, the the purpose of the report is to consider for the, the the draft annual refresh of the Tamworth Community Safety Partnership Plan. Um, as members know, and for those that are present at the the, the seminar, uh, we have a, a three-year rolling plan uh, for the Tamworth Community Safety Partnership, which is ourselves. Um, uh, the police, Staffordshire County Council and other statutory partners and voluntary sector partners around community safety. Um, I'd just like to discuss a few points within there. Um, this year's um, um, community safety strategic assessment which informs that plan is still slightly irregular from the COVID pandemic. Um, however, the, the achievements so far that from 2021 and some of the challenges we've faced are the continued positive partnership approach to vulnerable people. Um, there has been a continued high referral um, to domestic abuse support agencies. Um, largely, there has been an increased awareness of domestic abuse through the sharing of this, the, the county-wide priorities. Um, so that there are, you know, there has been a lot of help and assistance available for those suffering with uh, domestic abuse. There has been continued reported police um, ASB, and I think uh, all members had the update from the chief inspector. Um, and from a council perspective, we'd have continued demand on noise complaints and neighbour disputes, largely through people being at home more often. And what we've actually managed to do improve lower level interventions. So that may be a use of the noise app or lower lower level um, sort of warnings, etc. cetera. Um, we've worked with the, Caf the Staffordshire Commissioner's Office around hate crime and ASB and support mediation. We've continued to support the Community Together CIC befriending line um, for isolation. Uh, we've renewed the Tamworth Advice Centre contract. We have the support for mental health as a priority for all agencies and ongoing work will continue with the voluntary sector and the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. The Tamworth COVID-19 partnership received another £100,000 uh, um, grant from the lottery to continue their work. There has been a fall in serious violence and crime at this time. The ongoing work from the police to address county lines and substance misuse problems. We've had support from the county for the Staffordshire Commissioner's Office of Diversionary Activity and increased when partnership working for awareness campaigns. I'd just like to point from the, in the report, 
At this time, um, the annual report is referred back to scrutiny as the scrutiny for the Community Safety Partnership and then back to Cabinet every year. Um, from a perspective of the, you know, we are now looking at it using that annual refresh and that annual seminar to work with the, with the police and get an update. I'd like to propose that actually the Cabinet um, actually only hear the three-year overarching plan and at the annual refresh is only heard at, at scrutiny um, and a approved with any reports then going back to Cabinet if there's anything that is different within the annual refresh. Because you will notice the priorities this year have not changed. Um, they remain as they were last year with antisocial behaviour, domestic abuse, stalking and harassment, car key burglary, vehicle theft, community cohesion traf and tackling extremism, county lines, public place and serious violence and vulnerable persons and contextual safeguarding. That then is also backed up now by the Staffordshire Commissioner's Office who has agreed and confirmed that our locality deal funding of £61,000 per year will now be actually guaranteed to us for the next three years of the term of his office with an additional £10,000 this year made available for ASB issues. So as a partnership, we are now working on those projects that we can look to spend that role in locality deal fund across the next three years. So what I'd like to propose, um, as in the report, um, that, that members uh, from, the, from the committee consider the, the plan, the, the 2022 refresh for recommendation by endorsement by Cabinet, consider and recommend that Cabinet continue to endorse the main three-year overarching plan Followed, following review by scrutiny, recommend the endorsement of the annual refresh of the Community Safety Plan be considered at scrutiny only for publication from 2024 and report to Cabinet as required should the annual refresh report highlight any new or updated priorities or actions from the Council. Um, so that, that's the report, so Chair, if any, any questions at this time. Th thank, thanks Joe, and, 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 and thanks Marty, sorry I didn't introduce you uh, earlier. Um, questions or, or comments from committee? Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for the, the report. It's a really good report. I read it earlier and it was a, it had a lot of detail in there and, um, and it, it was good to see that um, a lot of the concerns that I personally have as a, as a town councillor councillor were, were addressed in the report as well. Um, some of the major concerns for me uh, are around um, antisocial behaviour in the town centre. Um, I think a lot of people are aware of the videos that were, were shared across social media this week with, with regards to uh, use um, having a bit of a tear up uh, outside one of the establishments. Um, I think it, it's good that the report highlights that and, and prioritises that because um, as we move forward for the, for the, the future High Street Fund and we, our attempts at, at making Tamworth a destination, I think first and foremost, for it to be a destination, it needs to be a safe destination. We, we could have um, Marco Pierre White in the town cooking, cooking up desserts, but nobody will go there if, they, if, if there's a lot of antisocial behaviour around. So, um, yeah, I, I quite like the report, and, and it's good to see that those priorities are in tackling um, ASB, and it, it would be good to see a bit more of a police presence in the town on Friday and Saturday nights to try and curb that antisocial behaviour. Um, the, the metrics that were mentioned in the report around the, the problem that the Castle Ward has with antisocial behaviour are quite alarming. So it would get good, be good to see a, a police response in that and, that, and that sort of fed back to alloy some concerns from other uh, fellow councillors. Uh, they're just my comments, Chair. Thank you. Um, just, yeah, I mean, take those comments on board. And obviously the, that was addressed quite by the Chief Inspector at the councillor seminar. The police obviously work to the to the things that become uh, high priority tasks to them. So, uh, uh, as you, you know, that that the incident in the town centre was criminality rather than antisocial behaviour. Um, so, therefore, yes, they are that's sort of fully been investigated, and, and the police understand and will work to those priorities. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I, if I can just sort of come in, I know Tim's waiting, but I, if I can just sort of mention that I think the. The seminar that we had was was very useful. Um, I think I think moving forward, I think it, it it will support the recommendations in the in the report, and I think we can do some 
some good critique in 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 that sort of forum. Um, I think I think probably, and I speak for all of us. I think we could we ideally we'd love to see a a, a, a police presence in the town on a on a nightly basis, sort of um, in that prevention better than cure kind of um, mode. However, we all know that resources are some somewhat stretched at times, and that we have to or police have to be a bit more reactionary. Um, but um, and hopefully, hopefully, some of these incidents are, 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 that, that, that Andy speaks about are, are, are very few and far between. Um, time will tell, I guess. Um, Tina. Thanks, Chair. And just on the back of what Councillor Cooper said, Joe, and I welcome this report. Um, I look forward to it when it refreshes every three years. Um, as uh, Andy has said, though, it does raise some, it still raises some concerns with me around um, antisocial behaviour. And I know what Andy's just said about the criminality around the town centre. But antisocial behaviour can be anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, as we all know. Um, and we've not just had the issues around the town centre, we've had a defib machine damaged in two gates. Again, it's criminality, um, but there's no, there's no police in two gates, no police in the town centre. So we need you to feed back to your, your into the mash or however you feed it back. Um, there's a couple of statistics that I question in this report. The fall in serious violent crime, minus 48%. What we've just heard would suggest something completely different. Um, all crime is down by 22%. Again, I'm not convinced. We've got issues of um, one that you'll be aware of, cars parking on grass verges that belong to us, but nobody wants to enforce it. It's antisocial behaviour at the end of the day. They're parking on a grass verge that is not their property to sell a vehicle. And I still believe that the, uh, the fear of crime is still greater than the crime itself, and that will never change. Um, recently, a member of the public did a freedom of information on litter and litter fines. That person will be name nameless because I don't want to give him any airtime. Um, 11 fines for litter and fly tipping in, since 2018. I report litter on a, day, on a daily, weekly basis out of a car, somebody standing next to a bin chucking it on the floor. So I find that only 11 fines handed out in since 2018. I'd, I'd actually question what our enforcement teams have been doing, um, and not in a in a in a in a nasty way. Um, but you know, we've had two years of COVID. Our environmental teams don't need to work with anybody else. They can work alone. They can be walking the streets, picking up on these issues. And I think COVID-19 can now not be used as an excuse not to get that done. I agree with um, Simon's comments around the uh, seminar. I think that should be a yearly event. I think it gives us a greater uh, insight into what the police resources are. We're, t we're being told we're going to get an extra 39 officers for Staffordshire. Probably one of those will end up in Tamworth then. Uh, that isn't going to make a massive difference. Um, and there's a couple of other things that I think I'll email you uh, separately because um, I don't want it to become a negative report because I think it is a good report um, and I don't want to go on to the criminality side of things but I do think there's some things that need to be uh, fed back. Um, as you know I chair up audit and governance now and on Tuesday evening we were told by the external auditors that there's service plans that are not, that are not up to date, two in particular, um, environmental health and community safety. So that gives me again cause for concern that there's something not working quite well and, and why are those service plans not up to date so that's something for you to take back to your team um, and, and I'll, I'll leave it there for now because I don't want it to turn negative it sounds like I'm, I'm whinging but it does give me cause for concern as other councillors will no doubt tell you Thanks Tina Joe, do you want to uh, come back on any of that? I mean obviously Tina you know, I'm welcome any discussions that you want to take back through to the police I mean when you look at the statistics yes I think 
you, you, you've got to take those in in the manner that they're presented. So, it, it, you know, depending on the amount of incidents, if there's only one incidence of something and then the next year there's a one incidence, a 100% increase. So we've got to make sure we, we know what when we're looking at statistics exactly what, what, what that is meant by. And yes, there has been a, you know, a, a, a drop in, in, in serious crime whilst the town was locked down. And, and, and you know, unfortunately, it appears that several incidents have come, come recently, which would then actually increase those, those percentages. So yeah, I'm perfectly happy to take that back and we can have those discussions through, through the portfolio holder. We've agreed to have regular updates with, with the chief inspector and we can take those back. I'll just hop in and say that um, I, mean, I appreciate nobody wants to hear COVID used as an excuse, but it had a massive impact and it's caused a massive backlog. And the officers are working through it. And as it happens, there's COVID money that's going to help us work through that backlog by employing more officers, hopefully at some point to, to do that. So enforcement wise, I wouldn't expect things to pick up immediately, but they soon will. Um, it's certainly not being used as an excuse and as Joe's said um, meeting with the chief inspector and inspector regularly they've committed to doing that so anything that wants to be fed back is it monthly? Yeah. quarterly? quarterly, quarterly. 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 Um, maybe more frequently than the committee will get to feedback you can happily feedback through me I will bring things up that need bringing up um, and it's pop possibly better that happening rather than it being you know independently attacked by everybody all at once so you know I'm happy to chat with you hear your concerns and, and bring them up and I did bring up quite a few with the, with the chief inspector and inspector probably could have gone on a bit longer but you know I didn't want to <laughs> but um, yeah I mean it's worth mentioning as well that we've got our own command back in Tamworth as well which is going to change the things I would hope quite dramatically so um, hopefully that's a, a positive we're moving forwards Thank, thanks Martin um, yeah I, uh, yeah. well I, I agree with you, yourself and, and Tina while, while Covid can't be used as an excuse it certainly has skewed skewed the statistics in a, in a way that's perhaps a little bit um, we need to interpret them in a sensible in a sensible manner because of, because of Covid um, Simon Thank you, Chair. <coughs> First of all, Joe, thank you very much. I think we're all very happy to see the amount of work that's being coordinated through your team um, on all kinds of areas, so so that's great. Um, I do continue to have some concerns about the provision of mental health and mental health support, and I know that was raised again at other committees um, recently, and certainly at the charity partnership meeting yesterday, it was raised again as to whether there is the follow-through from the mental health services not necessarily the there's there's announcements but not follow through so there is some concern there and i know you liaise through karen in your team so perhaps if you could just ask her what the issues were that were raised that would be helpful um as the cabinet member chair is the former um head of audit and governance um can i refer him to the comments made about service plans and covid during the meeting the other night Perhaps if you'd like to listen to the transcript, it will save repeating it all tonight. Um, but uh, there was quite detailed comments made. Um, at the meeting we had, um, Chair, the, um, with the Commissioner, uh, we were all encouraged to sign up to the app. Mm -hmm. Now, I signed up to the app and it's working fine, but I have to say it's made me much more aware of the more serious crime that's occurring. And I do think from that point of view, I'm sure that... Um, portfolio holders not complacent on this and I agree with you about the stats you know by definition two becomes four equals a hundred percent all the rest of it but the fact is that just by having that app you're suddenly aware of knife crime of drugs you wouldn't know necessarily it happened because they didn't happen in your area but suddenly you are aware and made aware because it's coming from the police so it's not hearsay or whatever it's you know genuinely we took someone um, into custody because they were carrying a knife so you know that I think is something that does need to be addressed and I thought Councillor Cooper's opening point about you know if we're regenerating the town centre is not going to work if if not and also I would think that a massive building site in the centre of town is the kind of draw 
that would need to be monitored, if not by warranted officers, then by um, PCSOs, to make sure that it doesn't become the centre for all kinds of issues. You know, I know it's not our responsibility if we're not doing the work to make the site safe, but it's it's always been the case that building sites, and especially huge ones, attract attention. So I would I would just ask. Uh, the uh, portfolio holder to um, you know carry those thoughts back because uh, you used the term for the police to be reactionary I'm sure you meant reactive because um, yeah. I'm not sure that um, they would want to be <laughs> seen as reaction <laughs> but um, but from a practical point of view you're absolutely right we are getting our own command back which means we'll have our own response team clearly they respond as alerts come up but I think you know, we'd all be very disappointed if Councillor Clemens right in saying we'll get one of the 39 extra officers. This is the largest urban area in Staffordshire, outside, most heavily populated urban area outside Stoke. If we get one fortieth of the increased police resources, then we need a... Well, no, you, because I won't be here, you will need an urgent meeting with the Commissioner to say why is Tamworth get, not getting the support it deserves? Because, you know, we are a very heavily concentrated, very urban area, and we're right on the boundary. So in terms of county lines and things like that, we're, we're closer, you know, to those things than others. So I do think, you know, should be, shouldn't be one out of 39. I'm, I'm hoping that, that that's a pessimistic estimate. But the overall report's fine. On a technicality, though, Chair, the recommendation asks the committee to agree that we get, it goes to Cabinet once every three years and to us every year. That's fine, but it can't say that we will only report be if there's changes to cabinet because scrutiny does not ha <laughs> scrutiny cannot be constrained. There might be the same priorities, but we feel that they're not being addressed or that they're not happening or whatever. And scrutiny would always have the right constitutionally to refer that to cabinet. All right. So as long as that's understood that there isn't a, you know, sort of circumscribing. I know Jo's a very experienced officer, and I'm sure she, she just means that, you know, the norm would be, but clearly committee wouldn't accept that it wouldn't be able to refer something if we were concerned. Anyway, that's a contribution from me, Chair. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Simon. And, um, yeah, I would, I would echo some of those, some of those points that you, that you made there. I think... Um, I think Martin has portfolio old if you can take back the and use perhaps the the future high street fund and rejuvenation of the town centres perhaps a little bit of weight to uh, to perhaps get um, get some additional resource I suppose from 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 that point of view but I'll I'll let you, you yourself and Joe comment on on Simon's points if you wish to. <laughs> okay, um, Ben. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to, to Joe for bringing the report. Um, I just wanted to ask Joe. Um, I'm assuming this is available to the public if, if they chose to. Okay. So can can we just have a look at Appendix D and data tables in the report? Now I'm a Castle Ward councillor. Um, and if you look at that table, Castle is top in every single category in, 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 in with regards to, to crime. And I'm assuming that's because it includes the town centre. Now, if I was somebody looking to move to Tamworth and I looked at this report and I wanted to know what the crime was like in, in, in an area that fell into Castle, I would look at that straight away and I'd go... I'm not going to move there, but Castle doesn't just include the town centre. It includes many areas that are where crime, drug offences, burglary, crimes against society, possessions of weapons, every single category there where, where that doesn't occur. And for me, that's a little bit misleading to just say that Castle as a whole is, is the worst area in Tamworth because it's not. Um, is there any way that this can be changed to reflect that and reflect the fact that the town centre as 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 the town centre is actually separate to the rest of Castle because I, I, I just I've, I really struggle looking at that 
to believe that what we're reporting there is actually true because I think as we all know the town centre when it comes to nightlife um, doesn't reflect how the rest of the Tamworth is you know or, or, or in many other areas as well thank you for uh, yeah I, I we had this conversation uh, last year with the chief inspector um, and the way that the figures are, are put in that community safety strategic assessment follow the lines as of the police wards uh, they are slightly different to our wards across the town in some areas but it follows the line of the the wards they the request has been made to look to see if there's any way that we can take take the the boundary of the town center if you like the castle grounds the the the, the area around the, of most of the the nighttime life economy i'm not aware at this time that the police have been able to do that through their statistics reporting but i'll certainly ask again through the the, the staffordshire observatory to see if, when they work and they pull the community safety strategic assessments together to see if there is any way that they can actually make that distinction uh, bearing in mind like you said yes castle ward and, and any community safety strategic assessment will always show that town centre probably in a similar vein. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can certainly ask again about that. But obviously, that comes through. That's not our statistics. That's through the police and through their statistics. So it would depend on how they gather that data. Three years, yeah. Because you know we've, we've already spoke about you know regeneration in the town centre, mm. and we're, we're obviously looking at. Um, more housing in the town centre as well, mm. um, and I, it, it's just—it's good to hear what you've just said that, we're, that that's already been looked at. Uh, it, it just really jumps out, and I just think it, it really paints a, a, a bad picture um, for, for Castle. Um, and it, it'd be interesting to see what Castle's figures of crime are without the town centre included. Um, that's probably more on a personal note, but thanks for that. <coughs> If, if you look at it another way, Castle's right smack in the middle of the town, so you've got potentially from the town centre everything heading outwards. If you separated that out, and when it comes to policing resources, it might have a detrimental impact. Maybe I don't disagree with what you're saying, but you you live in the Castle Ward, Martin. Um, and would you say you live in the worst area in Tamworth when it comes to crime and antisocial behaviour? Well, no, but my point is, you've got that coming, sorry through you, Chair, you've got that coming from the town centre, and you have all of those people walking back to wherever they yeah. live. So in terms of resourcing it, they need to focus on the ward, as far as I, I feel. And if you took the town centre out of their statistics, you know how the police work, if there's a hot spot, they'll focus on it. Yeah. So if Castle's not the focus... The, what what happens outside of the town centre might not get that attention. Get your point, though. John. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Chair. That's a fabulous report and uh, superbly presented, uh, as indeed was the, the meeting that we uh, were speaking about that, uh, that we, many of us attended. Um, it's... I, I'd, I'd certainly, first of all, like to reiterate and um, amplify the, the comments of the previous councillors, um, Clements Cooper, sorry, people. Um, they have absolutely valid points. The crucial thing that I see in Tamworth is the word safety. If our future regeneration is to succeed in any way, shape, whatsoever, this has got to be a safe town. It's got to not only be safe, it's got to be perceived as being safe. If it's not, we haven't got a hope. We'll never achieve anything. So I think, personally, uh, a higher police presence is essential. I think a police station in the town is essential. Um, I did speak with the commissioner at that meeting afterwards. Uh, he told me that he doesn't believe in police stations, that um, he'd rather have policemen on the beat, uh, out doing um, work, rather than sitting in an office, which is a valid point. But um, people, I feel, and if you go around and speak to anyone in Tamworth, well, certainly in my experience, 
they will tell you, um, what about the police? They'll just laugh at you and say, what police? Because you never see them. Um, we need to look at this as a priority before we even, even consider anything else. We need to make the same the town safe and not rely on statistics, which, like previous speakers have said, I'm very sceptical about those. You can make them read anything. And the fact that there are so few policemen around means that people don't report anything to them. Um, people are very uh, unlikely to start ringing up uh, after an event. They'll just, ah, oh, forget it. You know, It was a horrible event, just write it off. So an awful lot of that isn't reflected in those statistics, I, I suspect, anyway. Um, so I disagree with the Chief Commissioner on, a, on the provision of a police station. I think we need somewhere, whether it's a, a, a police station as such or a, somewhere associated with a new council offices, a new council building, where the police have got a section, a part of it, I think personally that we need something along that, that line for the well-being and the reassurance of, of, of local people. And um, I certainly will be pushing for that in, uh, in the future. Um, and um, I think that's the way we have to go. But thanks, Joe. That's uh, very, very useful and uh, very much appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Any feedback from either of you on John's comments? Um, I can only say, Chair, that of course we can feed that back to the police, but we certainly, you know, we can press on them to say that we'd like things, but it, it's really down to them how they operate. And, and I'd like to give them chance, having just you know returned to a, having a command in the area, our own command, to to bed in and get you know see what happens first, because things could dramatically change. They could stay the same, but let's 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 see what happens with them first. Thanks, thanks, Martin. Jo so, j just on on another point as well, I, I I know that when we were talking about feeding things back to the portfolio holder on things that concern councillors borough wide, I would very strongly urge that councillors um, actually connect with their PCSOs within within the wards. Um, they are currently uh, actively doing a period of engagement around the town. I think that the town centre officers are actually using the assembly rooms next month to do an engagement event, uh, which we are actually going to participate in as well as a, as a partnership. Um, so I, w I would strongly suggest that, y you know, as well for local issues, you, you, you look to, to connecting with those PCSOs who are out and about. So that, that would be the first thing to, to look at. But with regards to the issues that you raised, Councillor, obviously y that was addressed at that time by the Chief Inspector, but as, as the portfolio holder says, we can always address issues if we need to, and that would be the police's Please move forward. Thanks, Joe. Can um, is it possible you can provide details to all members on on that on that forum? Uh, I, I can imagine there there will be a number of members wanting to uh, to use that as an engagement activity. So that, that would be that would be great. Chair, so can I, sorry, can I just say that our PCSOs in Wilnicott did an engagement day, and the councillors didn't find out about it till after the event. The same thing happened in Bowl Hall, where I live. They did an engagement day and then told the councillors they were doing it two days later. So it needs to be a two-way conversation. It can't be us trying to keep finding out when these events are going on. The police need to engage with us as well. And completely, and I think we've recognised that, and that is exactly why we've been trying to actually put engagement plans in place so that we ourselves as officers know when the, office, when the PCSOs and the police are actually doing those engagement days so that we can also send our own officers. So, yes... I will certainly try and take that back so we can actually invite and make sure that, that ward, uh, councillors are aware of them, definitely. Thank, thanks, Joe. John, I know you just wanted to... Just just a quick reply, if I may, Chair. Uh, yeah, Joe, um, on the point you made about getting um, a good relationship with the, uh, with the PCSOs, uh, I do actually have a very good relationship with the Bow Hall PCSOs, who are excellent um, people, in, in, in my opinion. Um, I've, I meet with them once a month um, and we have a chat and they tell me what their problems are and um, I see if I can do anything about them and um, I've been to several of the, the open days that they've held. <coughs> Unfortunately I was one of the few who did. <laughs> 
probably because of the reason that um, that Council Clements has alluded to, that they're not terribly well publicised. Um, but they are very committed and very sincere and talented people. And I would certainly um, agree with you on that point, that all councillors should be really, really working closely with their, their PCSOs. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, Simon. Sorry, Chad, just very quickly. Um, the point that uh, Councillor Price raised regarding the statistics, um, I used to work in education in the private sector, and if the stats didn't tell you what you needed to know, then you were expected to actually go and do some more digging. And I do think that where the police are concerned, you know, for example, on the app, they reported a knife crime arrest the other week, and it gave an address in the sense of the place where the, the knife was seen in public. Now, that would very quickly translate into a stat that said it happened in the town centre um, and <laughs> not in the rest of Castle Ward. Um, and I think it should be perfectly possible if there's an issue, you drill down, you work out some things. I can't believe that any of these things are not postcoded as to where the event is because they need that for when it goes to court to say it happened on this place at this time. So I would just urge the portfolio holder to say to the police what he would say if he was at work, which is, you know, don't tell me you can't find out, find out. Um, because that's, that's what you're expecting. Just because it's a public service doesn't mean that they can just say, oh, well, it's the way we do it everywhere and therefore we don't have to you know, respond. And particularly if they've got their own command back, I'd have thought this was a wonderful opportunity to show the value of it by taking some local action. Um, because I, I was quite surprised, just out of curiosity, um, I'd, been, I'd looked at a property that uh, was up for sale and I realise now websites provide you with crime stats for the area. Um, and I would imagine if you read Castle Ward, you'd quite like to be able to differentiate between um, you know, some areas of Castle Ward, which is a pretty extensive area, um, compared with, you know, Bulbridge Street and uh, Litchfield Street. So I, I just, I can't believe they can't do it if they wanted to. So I would urge them to show a bit of proactivity here and, and, and actually do it. And that would build confidence. And also, as you rightly said earlier, it would then identify hotspots. And hotspots are what draws attention and resource. So if it underpinned the point that's being made that the town centre needs to be addressed, then that's you know the way forward. So thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks Simon. Yeah, I would... I would I would echo that to to some extent that um, while I'm sure the police know exactly where all these crimes are are being being committed, but it it, it would be useful for us to know. Um, I think I think that's really the the, the point. So, um, Chris. That felt weird doing that then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, just kind of thinking out sort of the uh, kind of box here, especially around the uh, uh, town area. Obviously, so we are. Um, well aware that you you want to um, add extra officers down there over time. I mean, uh, uh, when it will uh, happen, etc. We don't kind of know yet. And I'm also um, well aware of the um, comments of everyone else that when you, when um, you ask me if they uh, see an officer, it's a case of a uh, SWAT uh, officer. So over the town centre, as you know, meaning, meaning I own a business in there, and there's a, uh, a loads of 
other businesses in the town centre and and I ironically we also wanted to be a yes safe area uh, for everyone else our uh, current customers even our uh, uh, visitors etc so is it kind of possible because we all just want to help in them Come other way anyway. That you have a look at a uh, sort of scheme where we have an option of um, trying to report and stuff in that area, and then that uh, sort of data uh, can obviously uh, be used to. Uh, Target hotspots, etc. Uh, something that we uh, can look at and uh, keep an eye on. Because uh, when years ago, <laughs> we had um, uh, uh, that uh, town safe and that. Not that we ever care about it <coughs> anymore, etc. But whatever way, them them other businesses uh, been getting kind of old uh, safely. So we will do that. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, I mean, can you explain? Yeah. Um, the the town safe is actually the the um, partnerships in the town is now partnerships against business crime in Staffordshire, um, which is uh, sort of run through the police. Um, they they get the crime data. They organise um, and exclude people from the town. The the presentation was by Chris Beckett at, at that's the seminar. Um, and we would encourage, and members can be uh, any business within the town, actually not just the town centre, it can be within the town uh, per se. There is a pub watch side of it, which is the licensed premises and the evening economy, um, and there is a store watch um, side to it, which is it's not just about the, you know, the shops that are open, it can be other businesses, there are a variety of businesses. Um, and they they have regular meetings and they will look at crime stats in the town centre. They offer training for for businesses around community safety. Um, and and I think I would, you know there is a the the membership is financed by the members. The council are members but not paying members to that. So we are corporate members to that. So obviously the the, the CCTV um, operate. Um, joint services officer that goes to those meetings um, as does um, environmental health colleagues when they can um, and police colleagues so I would urge you know if, if there are businesses that would wish to have information about the partnership against business crime in Staffordshire then the, then I can certainly make sure that you've got that information uh, the the radio system is up and running still it, there is a there is a radio that that, that can be the, all business kids can talk to one another uh, as I say, there is a cost to that, but I think I think it's around one hundred and thirty-five pound a year. I think, um, and that then in, you know th th there are things that can be radio check safety, whatever that might be. You know, as do extensively use it over in Ventura, uh, as do the pubs in the town. So yeah, I can certainly send that information through, and 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 the presentation um, that was given by Pabsis actually at the seminar is available to members. So I don't know whether that can get recirculated. Yeah. yeah thank, thanks, okay. Joe. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at, 
at sending that through to you, Chris. I think I think um, uh, you may may not have been elected at that point actually when <laughs> i was going to say joe i think the by-election was still pending at that point yeah, so yeah um but it, it would provide the information that uh council was looking for absolutely yeah there was a lot of useful information actually there uh, on that particular point so yeah okay thank, thank you rosie yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Joe, for um, the very comprehensive report. Um, I just wanted to focus on the perception of the public when it comes to um, serious crime. Um, if, again, if you look at these stats, it's suggesting that, well, it's 40-odd percent down. I know from conversations that I have with residents that they really do need to... Well, they want to see a presence of the police, but I think they need to see a presence of the police for them to start actually feeling as if we are on a journey to making the town centre and the borough safe. Um, so it, it was just a comment, really, that this, um, these stats are available to the public. And I know some of the residents will be very, very sceptical of the figures that are in there because of conversations that I've had. So I just wanted to support everybody else in saying, you know, we could do with a, a proper police presence. I'm not suggesting a police station. We actually need people. Thank, thanks, Thank Rosie. You. If I can, if I can just add on on for what you've said, I think, um, I think that the stats are correct. I think it's just. If people see problems, they really do need to report them to the police, because I think sometimes people people can tend to just let it go by. It's just incredibly important for the police to have those have that um, that feedback so that they can then focus their resources correctly. And I think it's important that we, as uh, as, as 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 town leaders, really stress that to to the to the public. Rosie. Yeah, because I'll just come back on that. And yeah, I do think it's important. Um, and I always stress to residents, you, you really need to report this. But as time goes on and they report two or three things and nothing seems to happen, they become very complacent. Um, so yes, you know, yeah, we do need to urge people to report incidents. Um, but sometimes these are vulnerable people who don't feel that they want to be reporting incidents for any repercussions that might come across. Thank, thanks, Rosie. Do you, either of you want to come back on that? I think you know. Yeah, again, it's it's urging that that reporting mm. in. There, you know, if people don't want to do it through uh, the normal channels, one hundred and one or the Facebook page, the messenger service, or reporting online, they can still use Crime Stoppers if they they wish to do things anonymously. They can still use the Crime Stoppers. Tina. Yeah, just on what on what you've just said, Rosie. I think. Um, you're right, when people report stuff and they, they they don't see something happening, it's not always the case. Um, but it's like us as councillors, we don't always have the answer to the, to the issue straight away. We may have to go and ask that question. Even after 12 years on the council, I still have to ask questions about certain things. But I send a holding email and I think what needs to happen is if a resident has taken the time to report antisocial behaviour or crime or whatever it may be that's bothering them in their community, then all it takes is a holding email from somebody just to say thank you for your report or a, a telephone call if it's not done by email, just to say that you may not hear from us because we're, we're, co we're collecting data, we're gathering evidence. And I think that's the most important p thing, it's about engaging with the community. And, you know, we as councillors need to get better of that. There's so many times that people say, well, I've, I've rung so-and-so officer and I've not had anything back. It, all it takes is a holding email, a holding phone call to say, we are on it, we are doing something about it, but you might not hear from us for seven to ten days or something. I don't know. I don't know what the, what the issue could be. Um, and I just think we, we as, a, as, a, as a team of leaders, we need to get better at engaging with people when, when they report stuff to us. And the police are very busy people. They're not always there 24-hour... Well, they are a 24-hour day service, but 
they have shift patterns so they might be on their last day of nights for it or last day of days and then have three days off and be coming back on nights so they're not going to pick it up straight away so i do have a little bit of empathy with them um but just a, a holding phone call or, or some form of communication to say thank you we are dealing with it i think that helps and that's again why it's very important to report it and actually get a crime or report number because without those statistics, the police can't follow it up. And again, you're right, you know, from a point of view, if you, you're reporting something directly to a PCSO who does work those shifts, it's not necessarily recorded as a crime or an incident number. So, you, you, you know, the public really do need to get incident numbers. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Joe, yeah, I do think we are getting into the danger here of blaming the public. And I would like to say that I think we need to be absolutely clear that whatever the issues about statistics being skewed by COVID, because yeah, by definition numbers can be low and therefore yeah, statistics can waver. At the end of the day, it's a public service. It has become too distant from the communities that it serves, generally. Staffordshire may or may not be relatively good or bad at that. But I had an incident in our street a few years back where at 7, 8.30 at night we rang the police and said, look, you know, there's this that kicking off at the band room. It doesn't seem to be being managed properly, etc. And then nothing happened for two and a half hours. And we then rang them up when the bottles started being thrown. Then we rang them up again and the police arrived and said, oh, yeah, we had no idea. Well, all that that does is fuel the, f the public belief that unless, you know, you can say there's a street, the guy wandering down the street with a knife in his hand, nobody comes and it doesn't get recorded. And that is a big problem, and it's one that the police need to address, because otherwise confidence drops. So can I just say, I don't think any of my colleagues want to say that the public are at fault. We will urge the public to report everything, but we also need to make it very clear to the police that however short powered they are and however much that might impact on their own stats, they need to record what the public tell them so that the public feel that there is a real picture going on of, what's, of, of, of those issues. I mean, on the day we had a discussion about whether they could reach the levels of some of the issues that were being raised, which were, you know, people from their patches were raising issues about different things, which were genuine and concerns. And the police inspector said, well, given my resources, I start at the top priorities and work, work down. And we all understand that. But I think, you know, we, we have to reiterate tonight, it is up to the police to be in touch with us. You know, we don't have the Metropolitan Police. We have a much better policing service than that. But there's still that need to feel that if you ring them up, A, you can get through, and there's been lots of issues about being able to get through. And secondly, that if you do get through, it's recorded. And, uh, you know, the no recording is, a, is a still a public concern. And then when these stats are challenged, it's because people say, well, actually, did they record those calls? The public don't say, I'll bet it's because nobody rang, right? So I just wanted to get that point over. And I, hopefully I've not misrepresented anybody by saying we're not blaming the public. No, no. Thank you. No, at all. Th thanks for that, Simon. And I think, uh, yeah, I completely reiterate what you've, uh, what you've said. Um, I am conscious of our, our, our time schedule. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands at the moment. Um, so we do have some recommendations of the of the report. Um, um, I'll just read them out. The number one is consider the Tamworth Community Safety Plan 2022 refresh for recommendation for endorsement by Cabinet. Um, two, consider and recommend that Cabinet continue to endorse the main three-year overarching plan only from 2023 following review by scrutiny. Three, recommend the endorsement of the annual refresh of the Community Safety Plan be considered at scrutiny only for publication from 2024. And number four is report to Cabinet as required should annual refresh report highlight any new or updated priorities or actions for the Council. And I think that was the, um, the, 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 the one that I think Simon you had 
some concerns about some of the wording. And not Chair, if it remains unamended, I shall vote against because I yeah. think it circumscribes the power of scrutiny yeah. as as written. I don't think that's the intent, but yeah. I, I, I'm just saying it. I, I couldn't sign up to that as somebody who sat through more scrutiny meetings because I've been in opposition the most. Yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't say that. So I, I've I've sort of. If you've got an amendment to offer us, Chair, with your wonderful leadership, then well, um, I, I'm I, happy I, to I listen. I was going to say that scrutiny to report to cabinet to refresh the priorities for the council because that that really um takes out any new or up, updated and and br brings it as something that we we can do without doing it if there's a change i'm not sure if you are comfortable Chair, with could that. i just make a suggestion that item four the recommendation for is deleted because the powers of scrutiny allow us to refer to cabinet on any matters that we feel cabinet should know about so if we're seeing this every year then if we delete four we our normal yeah. powers apply yeah. and we just get on with the rest yeah. so but i would happily move on block yeah. one to three if, okay. if that's agreed yeah, I think, I it's, think. So, it's so hard to word it without meaning something else. <laughs> else whereas yeah. if you just don't say it, then it just leaves it with us to do our job. Yeah, I, and I think I think that would that that would work. Yeah, we're just voting on the first three, so um, I think we've had a mover and a seconder. All those in favour? Excellent. That's great. I hope you're both comfortable with that. <laughs> um, We'll move on. Item eight, which is the renewal of nuisance vehicle public space protection orders um, or order. Yeah. Joe, over to you again. Yes, uh, yeah, members um, are aware um, of a borough-wide nuisance um, public space protection order, um, which was actually brought in and the first in the country actually uh, in April 2016, um, with a view to giving. Um, an option and an ability for that certainly the police and authorised officers of the council to address um, issues quickly if they needed to with regards to nuisance vehicles. It doesn't circumnavigate their rights to seize vehicles or use other powers within, you know, for, for racers or people to dangerous driving or uninsured drivers, but it was a quick um, method of actually being able to warn and actually engage with some of the the issues that we're experiencing the a public space protection order it requires renewal every three years um and and actually the current re uh, period ends on the 30th of april 2022 so the, the option here is for us to um, renew this public space protection order to cease it um and I think, you know, we, we have um, a view from the police within the report that the actual public space protection order, there may not be many occurrences of issuing a fixed penalty because they do use other powers most effectively. Um, however, there has been a little spike in issues around ASDA on the car park at ASDA. And they would like to ensure that we've completely renewed this public space protection order to give them the option to warm, to engage, etc. It does not uh, exclude, as we knew at the time that we did the original consultation, um, pre-planned and organised car meets as part of an event. Um, it's those ones that do cause antisocial behaviour and actually require. So um, I'm asking from from as within the process that has, was previously agreed that a um, delegation um, is approved for the portfolio holder to extend the borough-wide nuisance vehicle public space protection order for a further three years. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Joe. Um, Simon, I'll, I'll let you kick off first. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that on a previous reports where we were looking at specific areas, um, Joe made mention of the fact that this wider power has been useful in that where we haven't got to try and then have one in every area because actually this one provides us with a very useful blanket. So f from that point of view, I think it's entirely sensible to renew it. Thank, thanks, 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 Simon. Um, yeah, I, I, I see it as a it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a no brainer really. It's something that's um, that's, that's that's clearly working provides that um, that extra sort of uh, 
ability for for for, for the police and for for things to be dealt with. I I, I don't really don't see a downside. Ben. Uh, yeah, just to echo what's what's already been said, Chair. I think you know it's been in place for six years. Um, it, it clearly does what it's meant to do. There's no evidence that it's been abused in any way, um, and I would be happy to move the recommendations that have been put forward. Thank you, Ben. Um, got a, a mass of hands there. I think Rosie was first. Um, so uh, we have it um, moved and seconded. All those in favour? Sorry, Tina. Um, excellent, uh, Joe and Martin. I think I think you you can you can leave. I don't think there's anything else on the agenda for you for you to to look at, unless you you wish to stay if you if if you would like to. Excellent. Okay. Um, item nine is the dry recycling contract update. Um, if you recall, we, we we asked for this to be presented to us um, on a on a quarterly basis. Um, unfortunately, uh, Nigel Harris isn't available tonight, and and, and Andrew is has been taken uh, sick. I think or can't 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 appear. We have got um, <laughs> Councillor Doyle to uh, to kick us off. Um, and I believe we're going to get a presentation as well. So, uh, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, to put a bit more positive tone on it, we may not have Nigel, we may not have Andy, <laughs> but we have got Vicky. Hey. And Vicky is going to take us through the dry recycling um, presentation before us now. So I'll hand over to Vicky. Thank you for having me, as you um, have heard, Nigel. He's actually off enjoying himself in Manchester somewhere, which I'm a bit jealous of, but I'm afraid I've had to come in as sub. I just want to give you a quick update on where we are with the new recycling service that's due to start over the next couple of months. Next slide, please. I'm doing Chris Whitty tonight as well, so please bear with me. As I'm sure you're aware, we are taking out the paper and card from the blue bin and providing the majority of residents with a bag to present this in and then using the blue bin for the glass cans and plastic. This has come about because the procurement exercise for the new recycling contract revealed that the cost of disposal for commingled recycling had trebled and it was determined by the Joint Waste Committee that the most cost effective <coughs> option was to dual stream. The current collection contract with Biffa ends on the 31st of March and they were, the sex, sex, that they were the successful bidder for the new one which as you can expect starts on the 1st of April. Whilst the majority of residents will be getting a bag and having this collected at the same time as the blue bin, approximately 3,000 properties on the rural hard to reach rounds will be getting a lovely purple bin and their collections will be four weekly with the blue bin one fortnight and the purple the next. To support this change in methodology, as it takes longer to empty two receptacles at each property, and also to take into account the impact of all the new housing developments across both authorities, a round review has been undertaken, and this has resulted in about 10% of properties needing to change their day. The residents of multi-occupancies won't go onto the new service straight away, as they are often our most challenging sites with regular contamination, so we need to inspect and upgrade each site before we can dual stream there. Next slide, please. First of all, I'll quickly update you on all our key outputs. The procurement of the bags, bins and vehicles is now complete. All the bins have been delivered. The bags have started to arrive, and our first new truck actually arrived today, and I even got to sit in it, which is quite exciting. <laughs> the disposal contract has been finalised and we have successfully recruited a number of new drivers. The interviews for the new loaders took place this week, so they should be in post very soon. I'll update you on the implementation plan and communications in a bit. We are currently working on amending the policies and procedures and updating the online processes to accommodate the changes. For example, we will need to add the paper and card bag and the paper and card bin onto our missed bin forms, the forms to order new bins, the forms to replacement bins, and to order additional containers. The operational plan has been produced with the round review completed, crews assigned, and rotors in place. We've stored the bins at the depot ready for distribution, and storage facilities at the farm where our garden waste go have been used to house the bags. 
Vans for the deliveries are ordered in and a rotor to do the deliveries has been prepared. A training plan has been produced and we're in the process of training everyone, starting with the recycling crews, but then the rest of the staff. We're not just providing training on the new service, but on the new rounds, the delivery methodology and the new vehicles. The arrangements for collecting unwanted blue bins will be developed in accordance to what resource we have. It's likely we won't be able to address this until after we've done all the deliveries. The risk assessments and safe systems of work have all been completed and form part of the training plan. Again, this isn't just for the new service, but for the new vehicles, deliveries and rounds. Alongside the training, the staff are being consulted on the new rounds and any feedback will be taken on board and rounds tweaked where necessary. So now this is the implementation plan. I think Nigel may have gone through this with you originally, but this is where we are with it. As I said, we've received all the bins and have sent out letters to the residents and landlords of multi-occupancies, reminding them of the importance of ensuring the bins are used correctly and confirming that if bins do have the wrong items in, we cannot empty them and it is their responsibility to remove the wrong items and clear up any resulting mess in the same way as if you or I contaminated, I know people don't like the word contaminated, but if you or I put the wrong items in our bins, we'd have to take it out to get them cleared. The bags have started to arrive and we've posted out letters to the rural residents this week who are going to be receiving the purple bin. And then next week, the letters to all the residents who are going to receive bags will be sent out, as will letters to any residents who are getting a day change. The first new vehicle arrived today, and we do also have an older vehicle that's going to be one of our spares. I think we've got about three or four of them now. We've, I've got a photograph of um, this afternoon of a, a little suite of new vehicles. They're all very excited and very clean as well. I don't think they'll last that long, but they'll be dirty within a month. Thank you. Things start hotting up as we go into April. We've ordered the vans we are going to use for the delivery, so they arrive the week before we start sending out the bins. All the new rounds start on the 4th of April, with the recycling crews using this time to get used to the new rounds before they actually start doing the new collections. That same week, we start delivering the new bins to the rural properties with their leaflets, and what we're doing with the deliveries is that they're all done on a residence collection day, so they get their new receptacle, a leaflet, a sticker on their bin and their bins are emptied so they've got a fresh start. We should have all our, bin, all our vehicles by then as well. On the 18th of April, we start the new collections for the scatter properties with everyone having their purple paper and card bin first. And then on the same day, the delivery of the bag starts. This is gonna take us four weeks to do. We're gonna deliver to rounds one to four on the recycling for the first two weeks and then the rest of the rounds the second two weeks. The delivery should be completed for the first four rounds by the 29th of April, so their first collection with bags will start week beginning the 2nd of May, and at the same time we'll start deliveries for the rest of the rounds. During the first collection cycle of the bins and bags, we'll be offering an amnesty to residents who may put paper and card in the blue bin. The bin will be tagged and recorded with the resident instructed to remove the contamination and then ring to arrange for a return. And that will just be a one-off. All the deliveries should be completed by the 13th of May and then the their first collections will start on the 16th. July will be the earliest we start to introduce the service to the multi-occupancies once things have calmed down and we have reviewed the sites. I've already mentioned a few of the comms, but we are using a variety of channels to reach all our residents and stakeholders. As well as the direct to resident comms, such as the warm up letters, leaflets and stickers to be put on all the blue bins to remind them what can go in, there will also be a suite of press releases, social media posts, the website will be regularly updated and there's also going to be a short film produced to show how the service works. So if there's any volunteers, anyone wants to be filmed, we'll, uh, we'd like somebody to do that. As I've already mentioned, we're writing to all landlords and management companies and we'll be providing training to all our staff and briefing to customer services staff across both authorities. You should all have a, a couple of examples of the comms tonight. We've tried to keep the messages clear and consistent throughout. The key messages are how the service works, when it starts, why we're doing it and what the benefits are. So hopefully, 
That's a whistle stop tour that covers everything, but are there any questions? And please be gentle because I am the sub. Th thanks, <laughs> thanks, Vicky. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, make a, well, make a comment, I guess. I'm kind of slightly disappointed. No, I'm going to start off with a more positive comment, actually. I think it's great that we've got, you know, uh, a, a, a sort of level of comms and a, a good plan moving forward. But I am slightly disappointed that we have gone with these new purple bins. And I know this doesn't perhaps affect so many people in Tamworth, but as it's a, a joint weights partnership, it, it, it affects the budget as a whole. Um, it's something that this scrutiny committee sort of highlighted a number of months ago. Um, I do know it was also picked up um, by the leader of Litchfield um, Council back in November uh, in, a, in a joint waste meeting and I, I kind of just, I'm, st I'm still just disappointed that we've, what I would say was wasted money on additional purple bins when there was a number of blue bins or a lot of blue bins that were going to be effectively redundant and could have been re reused with a sticker and I know we were sort of I know we were um, told that uh, that that was not a a good path forward but I, it's just a comment from me that I'm slightly disappointed about that in particular can I just explain, I, I, I'm sure you have had it explained before, but one of the reasons why we, we have to use a different, a different colour bin is so that the crews can differentiate between the two. And I don't know if anyone has seen the lovely bright purple bins, but they will stand out against the blue, the brown and the green bins. We can't afford to get the wrong bin into the wrong back of the truck because if the load gets contaminated, then that's the whole load gone. So that was the thought behind why we have the bins totally understand the, the thought process I, I, I'm just amazed that a purple sticker wouldn't have been a, 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 a an alternative way forward but I'll, I'll, I'll not comment further on that um, Rosie yeah thank you for the presentation um, I'm sorry but I'm slightly disappointed as well uh, I'm disappointed on the fact that presumably these are the letters that are going out to residents and there is no mention on there of if you need any help with your bin for vulnerable residents and people who can't put their bins out. I can't see anything on there unless I'm missing it or unless there's a separate letter going out but I know we did raise this, raise this a couple of times before and I find that really disappointing because disadvantage to um, some of our vulnerable residents. We do have that service for all our vulnerable residents and it's well publicised elsewhere. I take on board what you said that you would have been on, you'd have liked it to have been on those leaflets. The majority of people who do struggle would already have that service already. So all they would need to do is leave their bag next to their bin. But um, I'll take that on board. What we try to do with the, the leaflets and the letters is focus solely on the service and the change. So, but I'll, I'll take that back and uh, feed it through. I'll just come back in on that. Um, if we go back to minutes of the, the meeting where we did raise that, I'm sure we had assurances that that would happen. It would go out on the literature that went out, um, telling people about the new system. Um, I, I don't recall that. I don't know if Joe can, uh, can have a search through in, in the... So it would have been maybe October's meeting the call-in meeting potentially yeah just while Joe's look, look at that Simon yeah if, if I can just ask um, quite a lot of the residents in Glasgow have uh, to take their bins to a sort of common point on the side of the road um, which works with the bins in the sense that most people have found some way of putting their number on the, the bin. I'm just a bit concerned that we're going to be, are we going to be able to do the same with the blue bags? Because it, it, it you know, I'm, I'm in a row of houses and yeah, we all can roughly leave it outside our own house. Whereas when you're asked to put them in a communal corner, 
it's a different challenge that that's what I was just asking all the bags have a white box on them for you to put your address on in in permanent marker so that you can see where it's come from and be taken back didn't we didn't get that at the previous meeting as a bit of detail so that's really helpful mm -hmm. and when you say multiple occupancy um, I mean I'm a trustee of Art of Tamworth at Sacred Art and we have about I think eight blue bins and permanently a battle to make sure only the right things go in them um, and as I've reported at previous meetings we get a superb service from the collection team um, is is that what would also be classed as a multiple one because which, I mean which if, one, sorry. well there's a, a center which has multiple bins equally if you go to somewhere like Abelia you've got a bin store and the usual problems of cross-contamination when people shove things in the blue bin that someone else has carefully kept set so is it a case it'll be not just like groups of flats with a bin store but also centers where there are several um residents and, and are multiple bins to be collected will they be delayed till july to give time for a preparation it's wherever people share bins so there's clusters of multi-occupants and you have a, a shared bin area uh further questions and comments joe Could can i just ask if that was confirmed that it was minuted or was it uh, an assurance we it, the committee minuted that it recommended that there be an improved communication and advertisement of the assisted service available to residents. Okay. That's what we minuted okay. as the recommendation following that was the September 2021 meeting. I was just checking whether we had anything further at the November meeting as well. Th thank you. Yeah, so we, we did make that recommendation. It was uh, possibly not taken on board. It possibly wasn't passed on to me either. So I wasn't aware of that one, and neither is Vicky. Uh, but we can take that back and see what we can do about it. But as Vicky has already commented, a lot of those agreements will already be in place. Chair, Thank can you. I just ask a question which is out of the literature, because therefore I'm sure someone's going to ask me. <laughs> so if I can find out from you what the answer is, that'd be great. It says plain greetings cards. Does that mean ones that aren't adorned with noises glitter glitter is one of them it's glitter things. is it probably so so plain means plain as in it's yeah pretty picture on it but it's not got any adornments on no it. that's fine it's just i just thought i'm bad somebody's bad to ask so thank you very much for that thank, thanks simon yeah uh, just coming back to the previous question um perhaps that is something that's been lost in translation between portfolio but uh I'll send you the minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Simon. Can I just ask, with regard to some properties in Tamworth, which may not be the case in the, the, the opposite of the hard to reach in Litchfield and other places, um, if you look at somewhere like Thomas Street in Bow Hall, the properties are really close together. Having extra bins in the front is going to be quite difficult. So could you try and make sure that unwanted bins are removed quickly from those particular areas because residents really struggle to get in and out past their bins um, you know, because they haven't got anywhere else to store them because they're terraced properties. So it'd be really helpful if you could just make sure you pay particular attention to those sorts of streets. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, I think, yeah, Th those additional bins that could be used somewhere else maybe. Um, are you, are you offering to go and take them and spray paint them and <laughs> lease them back to the council? Purple, possibly, yeah. <laughs> Any comments on uh, on Simon's? As question? soon as we have the resource, as I'm sure you can understand, we're going to be pretty intense trying to get everything yeah. out to 80,000 properties across both um, districts. But as soon as we have the resource, we will be then focusing on returning bins but we will also be set for example I've got two bins I'll probably put my paper bag in one of them to store it in for the time being and then 
when I can get it collected, then I'll have I'll have it picked up. Yeah, I'm, d I'm just asking that you have a thought to those sorts of properties, which is, they're very densely patterned. There's, it's not just that one, but that's one that occurred to me is it's not too far from where I live. But there's plenty of others where there are quite tight arrangements, and, and it's just trying to help focus on those just in the same way that you have to do extra things to reach the hard-to-reach ones. So yeah, thank you. When, when you've got the resource, they would be the priority, I believe, for getting them back in. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, any other questions or comments from committee on, on where we are thus far? No. Um, Okay. Well, yeah, can I congratulate you on the fact that you're going to do it during the election? And can I remind all of you that you can't appear in any videos during that period of purda? That's what I'm saying. So the offer of a video, I'm afraid you'll have to turn it down. So um, we have no specific recommendations to consider. Um, I, I, I don't have any, any further ones. Um, to, to propose. Chair, can I propose that we record the minute of the previous meeting and draw it to the portfolio holder's attention so that way he he's got it on his on his to do list. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think that's fair dues, isn't it? I think I think it is. I think it is absolutely. Can't um, be too easy on these new cabinet members. <laughs> or new roles I'd say. New role. Um so yeah, we, we'd just like to thank you for attending and we'll look forward to seeing you in another, say, three months with some further updates and see where we are. Awesome. And hopefully, hopefully it'll all be implemented by then. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Steve and, and Vicky. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for when the change of bin day letters go out because that's, that's the one that really gets people. Sick, you, you, you're quite they're welcome. so organised around particular days. You're quite welcome to... Uh, to stay for to watch other other things that we're doing or or you can uh, or you're welcome to leave i think vicky is eager to leave <laughs> uh, i'd like to thank her for the presentation she's done because i think she's done a really good job on that at very short notice um i'm hanging around to fill in for jeremy so okay right. well partly I'm not taking the blame. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> oh. That's your that's your view, not ours. Th thank, thank you, Vicky. You, you can get out, okay? Thanks, Vicky. Um, okay. It's half past seven. We'll move on to item ten, which is the future high street funds update. Um, so this is something again that we we see on a quarterly uh, quarterly basis. Um, uh, we haven't got Councillor Oates, but we have, but we have got <laughs> Councillor Doyle, and um, we've we've got Anna, who's who's rapidly moving moving forward, and uh, and Liz. So um, I'll hand over to Steve to introduce. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> You're all well familiar with Anna by now, but unfortunately, I didn't quite catch the lady's name. It's Liz. Liz. Lynn, pleased to meet you. Would you like to introduce yourself to the committee, please? Hi, so my name's Liz McCusker, and I'm one of the Future High Street Fund project officers. Thank you. Um, I guess, Anna, would you like to kick off? Thank you, Chair. Okay, so this the purpose of this report is our quarterly update on the Future High Street Fund uh, program of works. Um, so you have a report in front of you, and I'll just very briefly take you through some of the key points and highlights from it. So we have been incredibly busy since the last time that we met you. Um, we've been working very hard with McBain's, the multidisciplinary team, who are helping us to deliver the programme of projects. Um, so we're, we're sort of embedding with them. We have regular update meetings. We have lots of meetings around risk, specialists that we see regularly, design team meetings on a regular basis. So there's a lot of work um, and, and there's, there's a good structure to that process and it seems to be working reasonably well. 
Um, in addition, we've also been working um, sort of internally with the delivery team of offices and with other external organisations such as the County Council, with highways and ecology, archaeology, etc. Um, so there are a lot of people now coming to the table to help us and advise in bringing forward um, this programme of works. So um, a lot of time has been taken up with walking around, uh, giving access to specialists who are looking in the buildings and helping us to um, and advise on key specialisms and particularly feeding into the design process. And the key thing is that we've now taken possession of the co-op, um, which is great. That happened a couple of weeks ago, um, which means that we can now actively and physically now start delivering that project. So that's the demolition of the, the newer part of the co-op, the 1960s, 70s, newer extension for the delivery of a South Staffordshire College. And it's also the refurbishment of the Victorian part that uh, fronts onto Coles Hill for the delivery of a second enterprise centre, which will ultimately be run by the Borough Council. So if I, if I take you through each project in turn, just give you a few highlights. So again, starting with the College Quarter, we have acquired that building now. Um, we took possession of the keys on the 4th of March. Um, so we're now um, working really hard to get um, designs ready so that we can now start to um, receive the submission of planning applications. Um, We've yet to find out if the college have got their funding from the DfE. Uh, we are expecting to hear um, by the end of March. Um, obviously that date is very rapidly approaching and they have still yet to hear. So we've got our fingers crossed um, even so. Um, so. So Matt who's just joined us and Mike Osborne, they've been um, assisting with looking at the design of the new enterprise centre for that part of um, that, that co-op building and things are progressing really nicely. So the college team are looking at submitting a planning application in the spring, so we're not far off, a couple of months at the most, away from that. Moving on to uh, middle entry, we now have agreement, we've reached agreement with the landowners, that's peer group, and we will have vacant possession um, from June onwards, uh, we're at the heads of term stage um, and we are currently in the middle of sort of sorting out those legals to ensure that that's all tied up. Um, work continues to design how we intend to remove the bridges, the glass coverings, etc. Um, on the, 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 the middle entry, the actual the walkway and what, what's above it. St Edith, Edith's Square, um, so again work continues on designing the square. Um, met this week with the landscape design team to try and move that project forwards. We've also met with the County Council's highway team to look in more detail at sort of highway adoption, what we own, what they own, um, and how that might impact on the programme. So the Castle Gateway, um, first of all uh, the nationwide part of it. Um, so we're still looking at the fit out of the Peel Cafe. Um, We've had issues with the fire escape route. We think that is now resolved and we do have a plan which we're just waiting for final sign off from the Nationwide. But it's forthcoming, they, they seem very positive about it. They've looked at it, they've had it for about three weeks now. Um, so I think we're pretty much there. We're, we're ready with planning applications, they should be in. If not next week, then the week after, we're really just waiting for the Nationwide so that we can press that button. So that's all really positive um, and absolutely on target. Um, let's see. So in terms of the Market Street properties um, opposite, we've been doing quite a bit of survey work. Uh, we've had conservation experts um, come to the site. We've also taken around County Council um, archaeology to have a look at the scope of the works that we, that we intend to do. Um, we've got terms agreed with Julianne Flores for vacant possession um, and they are looking at a relocation within the town centre which again is a really positive thing for the town um, and that's such a great retailer to be able to retain and keep. Um, in terms of the bridge widening project um, we're again at the design stage, lots of uh, conversations going on with the relevant heritage bodies, um, particularly looking at the issue of how we extend or widen the bridge and keep the scheduled ancient monument intact, which is very important. 
So those are the projects, those are the updates. In terms of engagement, just to give you a flavour of other things that are going on, we do have monthly drop-in sessions, um, not well attended at this point, but then perhaps people when they see the applications coming through and the consultation they might be more heavily attended um, we've added vinyls to the windows at market street to start uh, promoting the project so that people can see what's coming there's a qr code takes us to our transforming tamworth website um, so that's how people are being kept informed at this point so in terms of budget and time scales, we are still working uh, to the timeline that we've got. Um, so there are no concerns there about non-delivery of the project. Uh, we have got initial costing concerns. Two reasons for it. One, the cost of materials have gone up, which was unforeseen at the point where we put the bid in two years ago. Uh, not a lot we can do about that at this point. And secondly, um, the cost consultant form at Baines in arriving at the costs for the designs currently, they add a, um, a risk contingency to each of the projects. And at the moment that's at 20%. So all our costs are 20% higher just because we're at uh, an early design stage where we haven't been able to eliminate all of the risk. So, so yes, there are cost concerns, but going through the programme board and having that sort of detailed discussion, um, we should see those costs coming down as we take the risk off each REBA stage that we go through. So the more design we do, the less risk that's attached to it, the lower the cost should be. Still to be reviewed, and we, and we review it very regularly. Um, we have an action tracker as well that we, we keep up with things along with the risk register that we review on a regular basis with McBain's and also now with the audit and governance subcommittee on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, so uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks, Anna. Um, Tina, you have a quick comment? Yeah, are we allowed to talk about our walk around the other day? Yeah. Okay, and there's nothing that I can't say then. Okay. No, okay. Um, just um, obviously, <laughs> no. I, I uh, there was myself and Andy and and Simon as well as uh, Richard Ford. We managed to have a walk around um, of the the future high street sites, um, and um, St Editha Square. We're going to be losing the tent top. I'm really disappointed that Brian's legacy will no longer be with us. So all I'm going to ask you on that, Anna, is that we either use it somewhere else or we sell it for scrap value or something else because it's going and it was, the man's not here to defend himself now, but it was Brian Bill's legacy, as we all know, that it's never been used, it's, it's never been utilised, but it's there and, and it is what it is. Um, and if we're looking at St Editha Square and Market Street, George Street as a whole, when we're having those conversations with highways, because I have them every week, um, as a county councillor, can we look at whether we pedestrianise it or not? Because at the moment it's it's take your life in your hand street because it's uh, and it, dare I mention bollards is that a swear word these days? Because it's there's people, there's cars, and people and cars, as we all know, don't go together. So we need to either decide if we're going to pedestrianise it, then let's do it. If we're not going to pedestrianise it, then let's deal with it the best way that's possible because at the moment it's an accident waiting to happen although Tamworth is not on the high terrorist list I don't think at the moment none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow I'm sure Ukraine didn't think that they were going to be invaded by Russia at six o'clock in the morning they have been um, so we can't take that risk and especially on market day Tuesdays and Saturdays and if we want to do other stuff on the whole, it was a brilliant walk around um, without going into too much detail before I might get myself into trouble. There were some really, really wow moments when we looked at certain places. The, the views I have never seen because I've never been to where you took us in some places. I was actually quite square, scared in other places that I was going to fall straight through the floor. Um, and when you spent a lot of time taking around walking around, I wasn't that slow, was I? No. <laughs> I was a little bit slow. I didn't. You were a, fine, Councillor. Absolutely bad, bad, bad fine. Bad back sciatica don't go together when you're doing mountains of stairs. But do you know what? I was really. There were some real wow moments when when you took us to those places, Anna, and it was just some views I'd never ever seen before. And I can't wait for them to be opened up and for everyone else to be able to see them. So really positive. Thank you. Th thanks, Tina. And this was part of audit and governance. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, the three of us happened to be on the audit and governance subcommittee that did the walkabout chair. I, I, I want to walk about. <laughs> <laughs> The one view chair when you open a certain gate to see some you will you will do the same as I do and go, Wow. So ask Anna to take you around. I, I, I will. <laughs> um if I can just pick up on uh, on a couple of little things. Um the drop in centre for is that just for businesses in the town centre or is that members of public? Just confirm that. Yeah, so we, we had a business engagement event in October where we ran through regeneration more generally, but specifically Future High Street Fund, you know, programme of activity that was coming forwards. Um, and we, we we gave everybody who attended a sort of a, a package of material and how to contact us, etc. And, and then we set up the drop-in sessions so that if any of the businesses had um, a specific... Um, issue that they perhaps didn't want to share, you know, more publicly in a, a consultation event, but wanted to come and talk to us individually about. Um, at, at any point, um, they, they could come and do that, you know, confidentially. So it, it's um, once a month on a Wednesday in the evening. So um, offices are available, you know, when the businesses have closed, so that they can obviously attend, um, and they can just talk through, you know, what, whatever they want, if it's information or more detail than okay. then we just respond as necessary okay thank thank you um the other point was um with regard to like the the risk versus design costs because i was a little bit scared of the 20 percent um and how how does that affect the the initial the initial design of what we're going to or what's achievable for us i guess if you could just expand a little bit on that. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're in a design process where for each project, we're having regular meetings with architects and structural engineers and you know the civil side and mechanical and engineering, et cetera. Uh, and we're coming up with the designs that will ultimately fulfill the brief that we set ourselves through the bidding process of the future High Street Fund. Um, so there are a number of REBA design stages. You go from concept through to full design, and we're on that journey, and we're part way through. So each time you get to a different REBA stage, you've got more understanding of what it is that you're doing and more detail that goes in. So by the time you get to the end, you know where every plug socket will be and every light switch and, you know, um, the meter for the electricity you'll know where everything is and that that's ultimately where you need to get to then be able to construct it so as you go through that process the earlier you are in that process the more risk is attached to the design because you don't know all the detail you know and, and until we go through a bit further and we've perhaps tested the materials that are in the buildings etc we don't necessarily fully understand what the structure is or, or what the subsoil is etc so so you attach a level of risk to each kind of design at the different stages. So technically, as you go through the process and the design becomes clearer and clearer and more refined and more definitive, you should be down to zero risk because it's like, right, this is what we're doing and this is absolutely what we know it's going to cost. doesn't mean that there aren't risks in the construction phase that might cost, but when you get to the end of the, d the design phase, you absolutely know what that's going to cost you. So at the moment where we are, we're at design stage two, 20% um, by the cost consultants is attached to that design. So essentially for every million pounds we're spending, it's costing us 1.2. It won't probably cost us 1.2, it might only cost us a million when we get to the end of the process. So at the moment, yes, we are over budget because we've got those risks attached, which are part of the process of the design and getting it to that end stage. Um, hopefully when we get to REBA 3, where we're going to have a lot more detail and a lot more certainty around things, we'll bring it down to 15% and automatically suddenly, you know, half a million pound comes off the cost yeah. um, that, that, we're, that we're showing. Um, so, so that is certainly one element as to why at the moment we are looking at, over, we're looking at being over budget mm. um, but it's it's the process at the moment more than anything else. Th thanks, Anne. I think okay. that, that that was that was helpful. Um, Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, can I just echo uh, Councillor Clements's 
views on the walk around. I thought it was brilliant. It's really good to get feet on the asset and have a look and see and see what's happening. It's very hard to see it from a from a from a top down plan and map. Um, but to to actually walk around and see it was it was it was an eye opener. It really was. Um, the point I was going to make was obviously on on the walk. There was a lot of discussion around the. Um, older buildings next to the florist and I'm, I'm wondering whether that sits in um, infrastructure safety and growth with regards to maybe a future work plan that we have a look at them and build a strategy around that or or certainly have a look at what we're going to do with them. Um, I, I feel that it's pardon the pun it's fell through the crack a little bit um, and not being uh, and, and not being picked up I think we need a strategy around those buildings because they are a high risk item and I think it sits within the constitution of the infrastructure safety and growth committee and what they look what what we look at as a committee so uh, if, yeah, if we if we could do that chair that would be great okay well that's 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 maybe we can we can look at in next term um, as, as part of I mean it should fit in with these with these updates but maybe we need to separate it off as, as something I don't know if you've got any comments on that Anna. I'm only really to say that I suppose of all the projects that that we are managing in the program I think that one does carry a lot of risk and at this point in time feels the, that there's the most uncertainty around it um, and there's a lot of work to do still um, commissioning some survey work to help us truly understand the condition of not necessarily the buildings that are on Market Street, but the the bits the bits that jut out the back, the sort of ex the, the extensions of three store extensions at the back, where the cracks in the building literally are. Um, so there's a lot of work to do to understand whether those elements of that project are salvageable. I think is is probably the right word, um, and so. Uh, yes, there is the most uncertainty around it. Um, and I think it's just going to take a bit longer. I think in the timeline of what we're doing, we are refurbishing the Peel Cafe and Nationwide will move into it. We're then going to demolish the Nationwide. So actually, the refurbishment of the Market Street properties comes a little bit further down the line. So the, so the fact that it's got the most uncertainty around it doesn't bother me too much because I think we'll get to it. But yeah, it, it does have... A big question mark, I think. Simon. Thank you, Chair. With regard to what Councillor Cooper has suggested, since the remit of ISG is to cover the High Street Fund, then there's no problem. So don't let him flop you off. Um, uh, from, a, from a second point of view, obviously the actual uh, tour around was extremely useful, and I think um, it'd be fair to say that ISAG members who didn't happen to be part of the audit and governance um, group would probably like to, to, to have the same uh, benefit because I think it does bring a lot of the projects into perspective. It might now be better to wait till after May simply so that the, the people who are on the committee going forward are the people who go round, which I think would be the more informative approach. Um, that's if you haven't been kicked off Council Cooper because you, you know what the chair's like. Um, <laughs> But uh, from a pra practical point of view, I think it breaks down into four areas, as Anna said. Um, the co-op one seems to be straightforward in the sense that the site's acquired, you know what's there, you're pretty sure what's going on, and the demolition bit is straightforward. The fact the college still haven't heard what they should have been told, I think last October we were told. Um, yeah, it's awful way councillors remember things, isn't it? Um, so I, I just think, you know, it may come good in the end, but I, d I do hope that gets sorted out. But our side of it seems to be doing doing fine. Um, I found the, the bit about middle entry that gave me a bit of concern was not the plans you outlined, because I thought the plans you outlined were very um, you know, sensible for what we were doing. But there was a huge difference between the project as it, was outlined to council in March 2020 for that and what appears to be what we're actually going to do. So I'm concerned as to why there's such a big difference between a scheme which was put forward um, in detail to council and then um, the one that we're doing. Now, it's difficult, Chair, to, to, to say too much because what went to council was confidential. Um, however, if you go back to the March 2020 council special council meeting that was held, the detail for that project no way matches what we were shown. 
So I'm concerned as to, to why and how that, that's different. Um, and I did raise this at Audit and Governance as part of the confidential item. Um, if you know, that's great, but nobody had told me they'd told you, and I certainly haven't had any, what was it you called it earlier, holding email to let me know that my query had been picked up. Um, so hopefully it will be picked up because I don't want it to be like assets where you wait weeks to get a reply um, and then you're told the mailbox is full. So um, I do do hope we'll get a proper response on that because I'm, I'm just struggling to understand how if we approved this scheme, it's now this scheme and it's very different. Okay. Um, but then I think the last point on the historic quarter is really germane because at Audit and Governance the other night, the question was raised, well, how much would it cost? Because Councillor Cooper, as an engineer, commented that you're supposed to worry about cracks you could get your hand into. We speculate as to just how much of ourselves we could get. Even somebody a bit overweight and chunky like me could get quite a lot of me into this crack. Um, and what particularly bothered me and, and I think the officers are right on top of the issues here, is that historic England do not want to play ball at the present time. And therefore, you've got the problem of some seriously deteriorating buildings and historic England saying, oh, yeah, but so what? You know, just put them right. Um, and I think that's going to be the crucial thing going forward. And although um, enormous respect for and I think she's done a brilliant job since she arrived here. I am concerned by the timetable, simply because all this money is supposed to be spent by 2024. And given the state of the buildings now and the time it would require to put together an assessment and a planning application and deal with whatever historic England throw into the, the, into the mix, um, they were being very helpful over the bridge, but of no help at all on this. So I do think there's a real issue there which will need resolving. And in that sense, 2024 doesn't seem so far away to me. Um, and I think that's why it would have to be looked at very carefully um, because there are big heritage issues, some very old buildings. English heritage, if they want to, could make a real blocking move on it. And it's not easy to deal with that because my frustration is they never have to pay the bill their job is there to say no and we as a council want to create and as Councillor Clement said earlier when you go and look at where we were able to access to see what it'd be like if there was no nationwide debt there or imagine that bit gone but you could see the rest it would be stunning and that quarter could make a real difference to the ambience of the town but I could just see it being such a hard fight to get the permissions through without the cost going through the roof. So that, that's what I would say was my take on it. Officers working really hard, talking to all the right people, but will they get the cooperation from English Heritage? No reflection on what they're doing, just <laughs> English Heritage are not the most flexible people around. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I, I, I think I will be writing to Anna to arrange a, an ISAG walk around because I think that might well be quite useful for for. for committee that haven't uh, yeah. uh, um, happy, to happy to show you around as a committee and Liz has already volunteered with so she'll help me do it um, we're not letting lots of people go around the building because it, yeah. it's technically now vacant and it will very soon be a building site and I don't just mean from a demolition perspective we are actually going to be stripping out quite soon and removing a lot of items that are inside and really I think there's probably a very small window maybe post-election where we could perhaps take a group of people around but I'm happy to do so we'll just have to pick pick the days carefully when we haven't got contractors on site and, and we're not doing anything really messy and dusty which you know might involve PPE etc because at the moment it's it's okay to walk around it's perfectly safe it's just shut up so um, happy to do that um, in terms of um, historic England yeah lots of concerns around that um, I think potentially if um, it goes a certain way we might have to make some very difficult decisions as an authority if costs go up really high and we can't afford to refurbish it in the way that they would like to see it refurbished we might have to have some difficult conversations about whether we can actually deliver that project I think ultimately definitely um, your first question we've got now an audit and governance subcommittee 
tentatively booked in for the 14th of April. Yeah, we've, and so, we've all had that officially yeah, now, I think. Is it official now? Um, so I'll obviously be in attendance for that. I think on my own, I think Alice is away. I think I'll be on my own for that one. Um, so I'll respond to you fully about whether the brief or scope has changed between the final committee sign-off was actually July 2020 as compared to what, what we've talked you through. I'm not aware it's changed, so I need to go back and just double check the committee reports, but I, I will obviously. Just, you gave a to a round, and, and then I just came away thinking, I don't think that, that was what, what they originally yeah. said. And then I looked at them, I went back and found the, the, the relevant thing and, and it, it wasn't the same. So I, I just, because that included residential development. So um, that was why I was asking the question. Is that Market Street or? Middle Entry. Middle Entry. Yeah, no, we're definitely not doing residential. And I don't think that went in the bid um, that we but that, signed that, off. That, that means that what went to full council didn't go into the bid. So perhaps at we'll some point check. we could just explain how. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that things can't change, but it just seemed such a big change from what went through full council and which one assumed was what was then signed off. Um, so I, I'm just interested to to understand yeah. that better. Yeah. Could you, um, through you, Chair, could could you just pass on um, our thanks to Alice who isn't here? Because yeah. we, you know, between the two of you, you you manage this get us all around safely and securely uh, and can I say chair that if it's a case of organizing your tour around given the progress on the co-op site if that wasn't available I don't think you'd lose a lot we gained a lot by being able to walk inside especially the younger members who hadn't um, you know been there in its heyday and hadn't seen it all um, but uh, but but um, I think you would lose less if you had to skip that bit now that it's moved on so far if you could get to see the others, I think that would be really helpful because that will be more of the focus of what you're going to be looking at going forward. Thanks, thanks for that, Simon. Steve, I think you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, going back to the comment about having a, a tour around um, the sites that have been selected and that, I, if you, some of the more experienced members will remember when we were doing the assembly rooms, there was a couple of days set aside so that members could go across and see the work that was being done. What I would suggest is rather than just limit it to the scrutiny committee, that option is made open to all members because we all share a stake in what's happening and we all want to see it succeed. I'm already in the process of arranging something for Cabinet to do something similar. So rather than have little groups go off on different tours and that, we do something that's organised and offered to all members. I think I think that makes some sense. It's just whether it can be can be managed, and I'm not sure having a group of twenty people wandering around might not be so well manageable. But uh, I'm not saying all on one day. What we do is we set aside certain days that are compatible, and we arrange specific groups and give everybody the opportunity. Thank you. Simon. Chair, obviously I wouldn't want to disagree with a cabinet member at my last meeting, um, but I, I would hesitate to draw parallels with assembly rooms. Everyone was shown around and it still went 20% over budget. So um, I would I would focus on making sure the people who have got the questions to ask are prioritised. It's no reason to exclude anybody, yeah. absolutely not. But if there are people whose job effectively delegated was agreed by all the scrutiny committees which ones would scrutinize which then start with the priority groups of the people who will actually be receiving the quarterly reports but obviously the cabinet should should i, I would suggest should be involved um in a visit um but uh, but I, I i i just think that it is right when we went round we had four of us and actually in some of the properties four was uh, easily enough now i'm not saying that would say you couldn't take six but but i i just think you'd have to think it through because some of the properties are not in brilliant repair and therefore uh, you know managing a group safely around them um might might be better done in in fixed groups that's all but um, uh, the, the wisdom of the cabinet member will i'm sure have uh, much weight to carry with the leader steve I think you've kind of missed my point. I said give every member the opportunity for a look round. I didn't say go all at once. 
I've suggested over a, a set period where we can do it in groups that work and also conform to health and safety. Yeah, I wasn't missing a point, councillor. I was just taking the point that if you want to prioritise the groups with the responsibility for scrutiny, because otherwise there are a limited number of dates. And that's why I said include everybody. Perhaps you missed my point. I, I would, I would, if I can just come in there. I, I, I'm, I'm going to take an action as chair to, to arrange with with Anna something for 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 this scrutiny committee. Um, I'd see it as perhaps um, a wider remit for you, Steve. If you if you if if you want to do something for 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 the for the remaining members of uh, of the council. That's your prerogative. It certainly is. Um, any other, John? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got two questions. One for each of you, if uh, if I may, or a couple. If, Liz, if I can perhaps uh, just ask you about the the college funding. I'm a bit worried about this. It's taking it to the wire. Are we absolutely sure this is in place and it's going to happen? Um, the college funding that they've the bid that they put in. Are you talking about? It's completely out of our hands, to be honest. So they have put the bid in and they're waiting to hear and nobody that's applied for that bid as far as we're aware has heard anything yet so government had just delayed it from october to january to beginning of march to mid-march and we're still waiting um i think the only thing that i would say is if we're looking at risks and things like that we, we would have a flat site and if there's delays in the college having to find their funding, you know, we, we can do our part of it and, and have that site with, demolished and ready for a, a college build. But that's as far as we can go. It's completely out of our hands, unfortunately. And so, so, so effectively, um, if the worst happened, we could still, it wouldn't scupper our plans, we could still go ahead. We still have a plan, a plan B, if you like. Um, that we could continue and do other stuff whilst that's going ahead. That's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, Anna, uh, hello. <laughs> um, um, first and foremost, yes, the tour. I'm so, so would love to take the tour if you wouldn't mind taking me. I know you were very kind when you took me around the Peel Coffee Shop and very, you indulged me. I, I know you did. And um, thank you so much for that. You were told you'd signed it off. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you now know you need a whole day. Unfortunately, yes, I, I, I'm a bit thing, but uh, thank you for that, Anna. It was so helpful, and to be honest, it changed my my views. So um, it was very, very useful. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, the thing I want to just make the point of the um, design that you mentioned earlier of the of the new college building. This is an obviously crucial, crucial thing for Tamworth because we've got to get it right. Uh, because it's going to be there a long, long time. Long after us, it's going to still be there. We made lots of mistakes in the 60s, as we, we all know, and we're now in the process of basically getting rid of them all. The police station, the magistrate's court, the co-op, this place, uh, middle entry, they're all coming down. They're all, what, 60 years old, and they weren't... But if any of them were any good, we'd have kept them but they're not. They were badly designed and badly built a lot of the time. So the, um, the, the, the question on, 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 obviously this has got to be a building of quality. It's in such a sensitive position, directly opposite the church. Right, this is the centre of Tamworth, the centre of the centre. And it's got to be right, it's got to be good, and it's got to be impressive. And local people have got to be proud of it. Um, they need to find it attractive and, and so forth. Um, so my point is, have the college authorities been given a design brief uh, on what we want to see in the centre of our town, or have they been left to sort of just come up with something? And uh, my fear, if I may say, is a building that would look fantastic in Milton Keynes wouldn't necessarily look, be fantastic uh, opposite a uh, 14th century church. 
So um, have they been given a, div a design brief and guide for their architects to work from? Thanks, Anne. Um, so the short answer is no. Uh, the slightly longer answer is we obviously have local plan policies and a supplementary planning document that sits within that planning framework, which they will obviously need to comply with um, through the, the planning committee process. Um, the architects that they have, they're called Air Chamberlain Gaunt or ACG, they actually worked very early days with the college on the design and it actually formed part of our bid um, when we submitted to the government in, in July uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it will change because they're, they're obviously going to, um, that was a very quick piece of work to try and get an artist's impression over as to what the impact could be and what it could look like. So obviously the, a lot more work has gone into it now and, that, and they have been um, reappointed through the McBain's contract to work specifically on the college component of the programme. So they're just working on that one building. Um, so it will be different. Um, it's certainly going to be an improvement, in my opinion, on what we've got there at the moment, which is, as you say, it's definitely of its time and it dated very, very quickly. I think the issue is it's got to look good on the outside, agreed, and it is a very sensitive location. Equally, it has to work for the college on the inside, and, and, and at the end of the day, it, it will be a functional educational space that has to deliver an awful lot for, for the people of Tamworth, both young and older. So there's there's a there's a, an exterior aesthetic, but there's also a need to work from the inside out to make sure that the engineering space and uh, and all the other spaces that they need, and some retail shops as well that will be on the bottom with vocational courses like hairdressing and cafe, that they all form part of a really coherent scheme. So will it look modern? Yes, it will. But there will be some traditional elements within it, with say the use of materials. Um, we have seen a pre-app through the planning department, which I obviously can't talk about. That's always confidential. Um, but I have spoken with the college um, program management team. When was it? Um, was it yesterday? Yesterday. Um, and I did talk to them about doing a, a public consultation event, actually, for the college building, which, um, which is something that they really want to do. So there will be some public consultation prior to us receiving a planning application in a couple of months time so that will give everyone a bit of a flavour of, of, of what to expect and an opportunity to comment. Now the timing of that I think is going to depend on whether they get the funding um, which we hope to hear very very soon so there needs to be a sequence of events but I, I suspect they'll, they'll do some consultation in the next four to eight weeks. Uh, thanks, Anna. Yeah, you slightly worried me with the uh, building from the inside out uh, because if you go to that uh, particular route, you end up with the Lloyd's Building in London. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's got all of the pipes and all of the things on the outside, and it's probably one of the ugliest buildings on the planet. Um, so um, hopefully we're not going... I think the by the thing that we've got to uh, whatever the style, whatever the design, quality is the thing that's going to count for everything. If it's of good quality, it will last and have permanence. If it isn't, it will just destroy. We need a building that's going to add to the attraction of Tamworth, not detract from it, and um, it needs to be something where people think, "Hmm, that's all right." And uh, that's going to be a difficult thing to achieve, combining the needs of the college with the aesthetics of what we need in the town. Um, so I would hope that we are in consultation with the, or we will be, with the architects at an early, very early stage, telling them basically, look, you've got to come up with something really good here because this is Tamworth. It ain't Milton Keynes, it's Tamworth, and you've got to do a good job here. And it's got to be something we're going to be proud of. Thanks, Anna. If I, if I could chair, I, I do agree. It, it does have to be quality, but I think it also has to be aspirational because I think educational establishments should always be somewhere where you want to go and learn and be part of something. So I think it will be aspirational as well. Um, and I, it, it would be remiss of me to say we, we do also have a budget um, which we have to stick to. So as much as we might like lots of twiddles and bows 
we, we have to be realistic about it at the same time. So it is a very hard balancing act, definitely, to get all of those things aligned. Um, but I hope that whatever does come forwards um, is viewed positively by people and ultimately approved um, by planning committee when it comes forwards. Thank you. I absolutely appreciate everything you just said. And um, all I will say is that in years gone by, they had exactly the same problems, budgets, uh, aspirational views. They did what they thought was right at the time, and they thought what they did was correct. We now know it wasn't because we've got the benefit of high hindsight. They didn't have that. And, um, yeah, it's quality, and it's got to be attractive. That's the thing. Whether it's a modern design, whether it's a, a, a retro design, whatever it is, um, it needs to be worthwhile, and it needs to. We need to be proud of it. And uh, I'm sure you'll, you will, you know that anyway. Thank you. Th thanks, John. Simon. Uh, Chair, just on a positive note, the um, area which we haven't really mentioned as part of the project was the new business centre, um, which is going to be located in the heritage part of the building which is currently the 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 part with the nice tiles and the frontage and everything else onto Coal Hill um, and can I say I thought that that is being approached exactly the right way to preserve a property which is iconic to that part of the town um, and I was really pleased to see that that's how it's being approached um, because that that will that's something the council is in control of because it's going to be our heritage um, centre, our business centre, um, and what I thought was very interesting was um, Alice was explaining that the the current business centre tends to go towards slightly smaller groups, um, which is right because it's startups, um, but that this would actually provide an opportunity for those who are looking to scale up a bit, um, and that that seemed to be right that it, it was kind of taking the starter unit and and going to stage one of of being a uh, a, a slightly less small and maybe more medium-sized enterprise so I thought it was hitting the right notes but it was nice to see it was being done in conjunction with the heritage of the building that was there so I was really really pleased with that bit so um, thank that's, you that's, that's that's great um any other further questions comments if if not we there's no real recommendation other than we note the report and look forward to seeing you again in another three months, Anna. Um, <laughs> so so th th thank you very much. Um, you're, you're staying. I'm staying. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's just a point that I've noticed I missed. I was approached in the town by someone who charged up to me recently and said, uh, John, you're going to knock the co-op down, aren't you? The war memorial plaque in the co-op, hopefully it's still there and will be preserved and looked after. Where's in the co-op itself? Mm. In the in It the used to be uh, in the lift. Yeah, I was just gonna say the lift. Uh, by the lift by the lift there. It lists the staff who We'll take a, we'll take a note of that. I don't think I've actually seen it. Um in, in all reality. Oh. <laughs> You're right. I thought you were just picking out of us. <laughs> Chair, on that point, um, lots of other things that were needed to be preserved have been the co-op and been very proactive in that regard, so I would be very surprised if that has been overlooked. Um, no, but just to add to that, anyone that's been to the, um, the current TEC will, will see that we've kept all the original features of the drill hall there and, and done that, so that we're very much, you know, I, I think just to thank you for your comments all of you on that we're very much looking to focus on the heritage of the building because it's an absolutely stunning building and will be a great selling point and we if anything we look to magnify the historic nature of it so yeah we'll go straight away and find out where that is yeah. the difference is yeah. matt this one isn't within the historic bit of the building ironically it's in the new Obviously, bit that's due for right. demolition that that we'll sure that's, that's why that's, um, it's a vital point to just confirm but i'd be very surprised if it hasn't been taken care of because both parties seem to have been very aware of the heritage bit. And Anna, I guess if you can tie up with John on that one, and I'm sure he'll he, he can advise where necessary. <laughs> okay. Um, Thanks both. That's that's really much appreciated. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, we've I think we've noted the report, and um, 
think we're 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 happy to uh, move on. Let's say. So um, agenda item eleven is the forward plan. Um, the I think all the items on there that we need to look at, we are already looking at. So um, I don't think there's anything new on there, certainly. Um, so item twelve. Andy, are we are we not going to add those the, the at risk buildings to the forward plan? The, no, forward plan is different to the work plan. Okay. So the work plan is the the topics we we look at as opposed to the forward plan, which are, are major decisions that go through cabinet or council. For, so forward plan slightly. is published by the council, oh, right, yeah. whereas the work plan is what you choose to pick out the forward plan. Don't don't worry, Andy. It's 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 potentially on the list. It's a late one, and yeah. it's it's very hot in here. So you know, even, even the best of us fail sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so item twelve is the draft annual report, which has obviously been circulated. Um, so obviously there will be a final version, which will include actions and activities from from tonight i don't know if anybody's got any other comments on the on the report or are you all happy happy with the content simon just to say chair in response to what you said earlier i've thoroughly enjoyed being on iseg and i'm glad that i took up the suggestion to do an additional committee and stay on it this year so thank you for your leadership of the committee during the past year Th th thank you. No, I'm not standing again. I can say these things because I mean them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> rather than just because I've got to say it. Well, 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 it's very much appreciated. Thank it's you, Simon. Every, every good man was a better woman. Um, <laughs> so we're on to item 13, which is to exclude the press and public. Um, so. Um, do I really need to read all this? I could, can I just Happy say to move it as it's on the order paper, Chair. Excellent. And it's been seconded by three people. Uh, <laughs> Tina. Tina. So all those in favour? Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jody, can you uh, let me know when we're private? 